and yeah, I guess I should just start by by thanking you both so much for for um for being willing to do this. It's it's a it's a huge honor for me having yeah. you know been watching both of your films for the mm -hmm. past ten years more. Uh, it's such a great honor for me to not only to be able to talk to you both, but to bring you both together in this in this conversation. Um, I really, uh, in my opinion, you are two of the the most important living filmmakers. So to be able to bring you together and in this kind of conversation to to share and 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 talk uh, is really something quite special. So so thank you very much for that. Um, so the idea, folks, with this this conversation today is, um, I've prepared I prepared some questions, um, which I hope will get the conversation started. But equally, I hope that you'll feel free to just ask each other questions. I think the the purpose of these conversations in our festival this year is to bring together filmmakers in very different parts of the world from very different experiences, but where we hope you might find certain things in common or, or certain kind of aspects of resonance in each other's in each other's work. And so so I think you've both had a chance to be able to to watch each other's films. So I believe uh, Gaston has has been able to watch at an Arduat, uh, mm -hmm. Journals of Knudnerus Mussen, uh, mm -hmm. Day in the Life Many of Bullets. Say again. Many Bullets. Maliglutit searches. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And then I believe that Zach has been able to watch Wen Kuni and Bad Yam and Zanboko. Mm. And what I think we'll do, when we're talking today, folks, I think we'll maybe because the films in our program that, mm. that our audiences will be able to see are Atanarduat from Zach and mm. Wen Kuni and Bad Yam from mm. Gaston. We'll maybe try and keep the conversation in some respects around those films, but but I'm also keen to kind of bring in the the wealth of experience that you've had in other films as well. So please don't feel free to be limited to just talking about about those films. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the first questions I wanted to ask you both, um, mm -hmm. and maybe I'll ask this to Gaston first, and then I'll put the same question to Zach afterwards, mm -hmm. is when i think about your bodies of work alongside yes. each other mm -hmm. one of the things that really strikes me is i think a lot about the way in which you have both been able to decolonize cinema mm -hmm. and this very powerful way in which you have both been able to reimagine cinema free of the the impositions mm -hmm. of of the western world and of colonialism i've i've read you you've both talked about the the importance of 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 direct speech uh, as filmmakers of of um in gaston's case i think of usman semben and and this notion of of needing to totally africanize the style and conception of cinema and it mm -hmm. feels uh, with a Sumazak that you have created a very distinctly Inuit cinema as well, which is able to really step out of the shadow of, of the previous impositions. And so mm -hmm. I wanted just to ask you both mm -hmm. first, maybe, and I can ask Gaston first, just um, how you went about that. So, so how you approach that question of having to reimagine cinema well you know i i have inherited from my uh, from my people you know the 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 culture that i uh, i uh, i received from the uh, uh, past generations uh, learned me how to tell a story and i tried to match the cinematic language and the way of telling stories in my own culture. And it gave uh, Wen Kuni, uh, I, I didn't uh, make uh, particularly some, uh, some uh, 
I would say I, I just listened to my eyes, to my breathing, to my soul. And I, and I told a story rooted uh, in, my, in my culture. You know, so by doing this, I, I was not thinking that it would uh, be a, a remarkable uh, movie, but it was a way for me to communicate and to, to, re, to give back what I have received with the images. Usually uh, in, the, in the, the, I would say the traditional society, you know, uh, people are around the fire and uh, one uh, elder, you know, uh, uh, being a man or a woman will tell stories. And at the end of the story, you know, uh, uh, there is a kind of, uh, of uh, teaching that comes out, you know. And, um, and to me, uh, my first film was a kind of storytelling around the fire, you know. Uh, and when people received it, it uh, it uh, seemed it seemed to them that I just give them I just gave them back what they, they already knew, but with a new uh, I would say a new way of uh, of presenting the story because they can see the images, you know, and uh, uh, yes, it, it's like that. For me, I didn't want to tell the story in um, the way that uh, I would say the, the, the Western movies are told because it doesn't uh, have any effect here. Even people were, people were already exposed to Hollywood cinema. They knew that. But me, I wanted to tell them a story in a way that belongs to them for you know for millenniums and centuries you know and and i was not sure that i would i um, shall succeed in a way but it was so clear that i couldn't tell it differently the spacing you know uh, the way that i i framed the landscape you know all those things uh, was uh, a kind of uh, uh, inside. Oh, Gaston, I think we've lost your audio again. I'm really sorry, Gaston. I think I can't. Zach, can you hear Gaston? Oh, uh, you're, you're back now, Gaston. You're back now. Oh, oh, and now gone again. <laughs> Gaston, I'm so sorry if for some reason the audio has cut out again. I, I think to I see that Toussaint's audio has been muted. Maybe we could ask to unmute. Oh, Toussaint has disappeared. Maybe whilst we're waiting for Gaston to kind of just uh, plug things back in again. And, and uh, Zach, maybe would you be willing to respond to, to, what, to what Gaston said there, both in terms of if you wanted to respond to anything that he said, but also just going back to that question of reimagining cinema. I know that you are someone I've read about you. You grew up going to the cinema and you watched, you watched these Western films and 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 films like dances with wolves and felt this deep need to kind of reimagine cinema from an inuit point of view to kind of decolonize mm -hmm. cinema maybe you could tell us about that and please feel free to respond to anything that gaston has said mm. um 55 years ago i came off the land uh, like my father before them they always lived on the land and 55 years ago um there was no TV, there was no telephone, no iPad, nothing. I mean, we're just living off, off the land. And storytelling is what we heard when we 
went to bed because a lot of stories I heard were bedtime stories for us to put us to sleep. Um, so when I heard about Atanab Duet, it's a long, long story. I would fall asleep and next night I would tell my mother, <laughs> can we recontinue where I remember it? <laughs> so that those I've known these stories. Um, but when I came to Igalik, I saw movies and I saw cowboys and Western movies. Hi. Uh, right. Um, but because uh, in our culture, uh, we, when Europeans came, uh, we got Christianized and uh, this, our traditional songs and ayaya songs and drum dancing and storytelling were banned uh, by the church. Uh, because I was on the Anglican side, uh, it was really restricted uh, when I was growing up. Uh, I came to Illurik in 1966. I was nine years old. I came for school and my cousins <laughs> are, are on the uh, Catholic side and I would look out the window and I would be playing baseball and I'm not allowed to go outside. So a lot of stories we heard and a lot of stories when I make them into film, um, I put my community to work. Uh, first, if I'm trying to tackle a story, uh, for example, uh, the fast runner at an object, uh, it was a whole, uh, the, when we heard the story, it happened here, it happened there. And when you try to film it, you need, you have missing gaps. So we had to create uh, the bridges, uh, but uh, what I do, why I started was, I was so afraid that one day my grandchildren will ask me about shamanism. And I don't know one thing about shamanism because Christianity uh, banned it when I was growing up and I didn't hear it from my parents because, uh, <laughs> They were already uh, colonized. Um, so trying to fight back uh, why we need these stories, because in, in the Arctic, we're 200 miles above the Arctic Circle. And we lose the sun sometimes in the winter. The sun disappears for a whole month and then it comes back. And this time of the year, we lose the night, it's daylight all the time now. Um, so a lot of these movies I make, uh, I try to put um, somebody will learn something uh, in my films. And I have long shots because in one frame, it's, and that person is talking, we were concentrating on the person that's talking, but in the background, there could be kids playing with knives, make carving snow out. I mean, that's interesting. So I would leave that frame and let people talk. And that's how I work first with elders, meet with them for a week, hash out the story, uh, what was said, and then go out there and do the filming. But the way I film is not like uh, the, how Southerners make film uh, because they make films in military style because I'm the director. You cannot talk to me. You have to talk to my assistant or my assistant's assistant before you talk to me. So it's, I don't work like that. <laughs> we work horizontal uh, because my sound man could be talking to me, my actors could be talking to me. What if we do it this way? Or my cameraman could talk to me. What if I shoot it this way? And so we have conversation on set to get the best shot. 
Uh, so that's that's how I work. I mean, we talk to each other, but if I was southern, you would never get to me uh, because uh, it's horizontal, and we're we're in horizontal and military style is up up the ladder. Um, yeah, I was so afraid when I grew up, my grandchildren would ask me how did our culture live. And I would know, so I went, I don't know why, because this community where I am from, Iglulik, voted TV out twice in 1975 and again in 79. There was no nothing in the airwaves in our language. It's only when Inuit broadcasting started in 1983, uh, TV came to my community, um, but I was already starting uh, my own dream. Where in 1981, I went down south to Montreal and bought myself a video camera, uh, brought it back to the Arctic. When there's no TV in my community, I would put on my TV and some recorded and I would start watching TV and all the kids playing outside would be glued to my window. And sometimes they would be in, in my little matchbox house, uh, all looking at the box. So I had the idea that uh, this is where, if I want to teach these kids, that's where I should put it. That, I had that idea, uh, so so I've been working at it, to, and today we have our own TV, we have TV on the air, on Shah, I mean, you know, it's a, coming off the land and trying to learn English and trying to learn how to work the camera, <laughs> making a lot of mistakes, uh, that's how I work. Try it here. Thank you very much, Zach. How 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 are you doing, Gaston? Are you are you? Can we hear I, you? I, I heard the the last uh, five to six minutes of uh, Zach and uh, uh, talk. Good. Now so it worked again, but I don't know how long it's going to to uh, to last. And yeah. So we, we are going to try to resolve. You know, we are used to do a lot of Zooms. You know, yesterday we did, and I don't know why today uh, there, there is a, a, a problem of provider or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, let, let us continue <laughs> as it works. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank, thank you, you for all those uh, very sensitive things you said. Yeah. Maybe we could, we could, I, I think one of one of the things that I'm hearing, and and it's very evident from watching both of your films, is the the strong presence of orality, and different mm. forms of oral mm. culture, and mm. and and um, so Zacharias has, has talked about hearing stories from his mother, and mm. and Gaston, you've talked about hearing the stories which have then become films. Maybe could you tell us a bit more specifically with Wen Cooney? Tell us, where did the story come from? Was that a story that you were told or was it parts of stories you were told? Where did the story for that film come from? Um, uh, as, far, uh, uh, as far as I can uh, recall it, you know, it's, it's not a pre-existing story, but it is a, a mix of all the, the, the stories I heard when I was... Uh, uh, a young kid, you know, uh, because I was studying in the, the, the city of Ouagadougou, the capital city, and during uh, the holidays, my cousin uh, from the village, the village of my father, will come to Ouagadougou to spend one week, two weeks, or three weeks with us. Mm -hmm. And I was very, very, you know, um, uh, I, I, I was uh, envying them because they, they, some of them are going to the modern school like me, 
but they knew other things that I couldn't know. For instance, when we go outside uh, the, the, the urban city itself, and we go in the bush around Ouagadougou, they know uh, all the names of the, the trees, you know, the names of the birds. And I, I said, why we don't learn that in my school in Ouagadougou? Because they have uh, the two cultures, you know, they, they, they have the, 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 the local culture with all the things they learn. And, and also they were able to tell a lot of stories that I couldn't know. So for me, they became kind of uh, teachers for me, you know, and, and uh, it's how I enlarged my knowledge about the nature, about climate, you know, they can look to the sky and they say, oh, certainly it's going to, to rain in about uh, a couple of hours. And I was completely, uh, you know, I knew that my father and my mother uh, and my grandmother living with us uh, in, our, uh, in our compound in the city, they were able to speak about the direction of the clouds and say that, uh, oh, if the wind doesn't uh, blow, then we, 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 we shall have a rain. But they were more aged, aged than me. And I can uh, understand that, but I see uh, people of seven years old, eight, year old, eight years old, and they were so full of knowledge that I say, what am I learning in my modern school? You know, I would have, uh, I knew more the, 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 the trees, the names of the trees in France, the rivers, you know, the seasons, the four seasons, and I didn't know much about my own, my own uh, environment. So they, 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 they have very, they have been very, very, um, you know, important for my uh, my classical uh, teaching because I call the knowledge of my uh, my um, uh, traditional society that was the classical knowledge, you know. And, uh, and when I was writing when Kuni, I just let myself guided by all the sounds I was hearing, you know, and I, I, I wanted to, I would have loved to be a shepherd with my, uh, with my sheep, you know, in the fields, in the bush that I couldn't do. My cousins, they, they did that and they told me about, uh, you know, uh, when they are in the bush and they were alone, the strange sounds they can hear and uh, all those things. So I, I believe I have just tried to, um, uh, to tell a story uh, belonging to my, my people. And uh, when people uh, saw the film for the first time in Ouagadougou, many of them uh, believed it was uh, a, a, a real, uh, I mean, a real story. And some of them would uh, uh, be uh, a little bit uh, confused saying that, but he's not an orphan. Uh, he, he has never been, uh, been dumb, you know? How could he tell the story, you know? But for me, it came just like that, you know? The first time I started writing the script, I was still studying in Paris, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the uh, University of Sorbonne, where I was studying history. And when I went to the film school for two years, I started writing this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, yes, this story. And when I came, you know, I came back in 76. So six years before I completed uh, the, the, the film when Kuni, you know, and even the name, the name is not a typical name that was existing. Uh, uh, and I, I call it uh, the, the gift of God uh, in my language, if I translate it. And then after the film has been released, a lot of, uh, uh, babies have been given the name Wenguni, 
you know it, it was it was part of our what we knew but it was not uh, it was not uh, uh, often that this name was given now it's uh, a typical name is the way that I, I took from my culture uh, I invented a story I gave it back to my society and they they completely uh, you know uh, absorbed my story uh, till the level that now a lot of people are are uh, completely you know driven uh, by by the the humor by the and and now as you know because when I made Budiam that was a sequel of Wen Kuni now even yesterday some people were asking me so when the, the third part will come out. And I say, well, uh, I don't know yet. And uh, some, sometimes people look to me uh, with a smile uh, saying that he has become lazy, this guy. Bring, bring the, the film to us, you know? <laughs> so I, I know that I, I could not escape. It's a kind of duty uh, for me and I'm writing uh, very, very, seriously and i hope that i will uh, i will uh, uh, i mean i shall surprise them you know it will be their story but i i shall tell it in a way that they will be completely uh, uh, you know mysterized i hope so you know but uh, still i hope that i i shall be able to de to do the third part like my first film with a lot of humility and uh, and uh, uh, you know trying to to reach a kind of purity you know a kind of uh, simplicity that comes out from a, 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 a art work you know i hope so this is what i am dreaming to thank you very much gaston so a kind of drawing on some of the themes of what you've just said there gaston and a question for zach um, one of the things that really interest, and going back to this 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 question of orality and how orality and oral culture becomes part of cinema, or how as filmmakers you you've both drawn upon oral culture. One of the things that really interests me, Zach, I, I I read something that you had contributed to a book on Atanarjuat, and and you were talking about you were talking about when you you'd heard the myth of Atanarjuat from from your mother. And um, I'm just trying to find the quote here, what you said. So, yeah, you said, once you get that picture into your head of that naked man running for his life across the ice, his hair flying, you never forget it. It had everything in it for a fantastic movie, love, jealousy, murder, revenge, an ancient Inuit action thriller. And yeah. one of the things that strikes me, which I find so interesting about that, Zach, is when you talk about an oral legend, you it feels like you're talking about cinema and so I, I guess the question i wanted to ask you is whether you thought that there is something about cinema or video or that that allows oral culture to to i'm not i'm not phrasing this question very well uh, is, is there do cinema and oral culture have something in common this is my question. Yes, yes, yes. I remember um, when we started watching 16 millimeter films, American films, Cowboys and Indians. My parents, who doesn't work, know one word of English, they would go to movies. <coughs> Excuse me. They would go to movies and they would sit with their buddies. And I remember seeing my father and his stepbrother talking to each other when we started watching uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the, the, the classic uh, Western movie. Uh, I remember my father saying, okay, that's going to be me, that's going to be you, let's see how this ends. So <laughs> that's how my parents watched movies. Um, so. So I mean, sometimes they would see mm -hmm. 
I've had that guy died in the last movie. I mean, they would talk like that because they didn't, <laughs> we didn't know. Uh, movies, we thought they were God sent. We didn't know about camera. We didn't know how many people worked behind the camera. Uh, um, so when we, when I got my hands on a camera, I wanted to uh, use it because my father would go hunting and he would come back, start drinking tea with his hunting buddies and they would tell a terrific story of how the hunt was. And I was imagining what if I could turn that capture so everybody can see it. Uh, that's, that's what's, what was going through my head because I know my sons will want to learn from watching um, yeah, oral history is great I mean we come from oral history because in the Arctic we had no paper and pencil to write on because every important agreements like marriages and deals were all done in the head and they never forget uh, uh, they only say it once. That's the beauty of this culture. You only tell them once. What if you start telling them five times? They already heard it. They know. Uh, they're going to just act to it later on. So in the film, one day, the, the, the government agent keeps asking, tell him again, tell him again. I mean, you have to tell it once, they, they'll understand it. They don't have to, they don't have to be kept reminded. Uh, but in, in one day, they, I wanted to show that uh, the government agent asking, tell him again, tell him again. <laughs> so, so I would, I like, I like to show this. Uh, yeah, that's. It's our culture is not just about trying to survive in the cold. And sometimes, of course, we force to death, we starve to death. Uh, but they were games, they were string games. They would travel hundreds of miles just to learn one string, string art. Mm. I mean, they're, they're not just starving to death, they're having. Some, there's something going on. There's so much that we don't know that something going on. Little children are being taught from the day they could start listening. Uh, they're mm -hmm. taught. So in, in this culture, we watch mm -hmm. and learn. We watch and learn. That, mm -hmm. That's the beauty of this culture I like. Is we watch these movie stars and now we could, we could do it too. I mean, that's how it's mm -hmm. been in my mind. If they can do it, I can do it too. Thank you. That's, mm. a, that's a wonderful response. A wonderful response. Mm. Gaston. Yeah. Can I say something Please. about, you know, the orality? I, 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 I think, you know, and probably is the same case uh, um, from what I've seen in the movies of Zacharias, that I like very much, Zacharius. Uh, I said to, to in one of my emails to Jamie that I, I liked, uh, I liked very much the framing, you know, the the spacing and the the rhythm of the story being told, and the way that you 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 balance the nature and the human beings because. This, I, I am very sensitive to that. And what I wanted to say is that, you know, when I went to shoot my scenes in the countryside, it was something uh, very, very surprising to me. The people being around of the set, you know, uh, they respect the work that we are doing. I explained to them when I say basi bure, it means in my uh, native tongue, stop doing any noise, you know? And uh, they accept, 
and all the, all the village stopped. And one day, a, a baby was crying, and uh, the guy was, was about to tell to the mother, go away with your, 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 uh, your baby because he, he, he disturbs the, the work being done here. I say, no, 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 let her be there. It, it's, it's okay. Then when we were ready, I said, Basi Bure, stop the noise. And the baby stopped instinctively to cry. And everybody laughed. And then he started again crying. You know, I said, you know, he obeys more than you and better than you. So it, it, it is something shooting in a village. The, the shooting, the, the movie being made becomes part of the village. And I like that because I don't go there to, uh, to make an exotic uh, film. It's about them. So I want them to, to witness that I'm not uh, betraying anything about them. I'm telling, of course, drama. And the second thing is when I, I take one of them to play an extra character or something like that, Sometimes it happens that the, the, the guy being a man of, or a woman doesn't understand at once what I'm saying. And uh, because also of the, you know, the emotion. And then you have people trying to help me explaining. So I let them talk to, the, to my, my extra character. And, uh, and after the, the shot, I go to see them. Uh, normally, I'm the only one to speak here. <laughs> if I don't defend myself, they will took over me and make the film to my place because they understand what is film. You know, in our uh, uh, indigenous culture, a lot of things deal with representation. When a baby comes to birth, you know, when we have funerals, you know, everything they are used to theater, social theater, to representation. So when you see uh, my film, many people, when I show the, the films, even including Burkinabe people, meaning people of my country, they ask me, who did you find this, uh, this farmer? I say, but he's not a farmer. He is a, a professor of natural sciences, you know, but, this guy has been able to re uh, to to understand because he is he is from this culture. So it was not like he was imitating something. He just try. I always say to them, even when you when you are acting, even I have my eyes closed, I can and I hear you speaking. I know that you are not acting right because the words should not come only from your mouth. It comes from your stomach, from your soul, you know? And it's the way that I'm working with, with all my actors and actresses, but I have, I have been really, really, um, uh, you know, uh, struck by the fact that the people, the normal people, they know about representation. They know about acting. They know because in their normal life, during the traditional ceremonies and the rituals, they are used to be in representation. It's what I just wanted to, to add to what uh, Zat Zakaria said. Thank you very much, Gaston. So another question, just pick, picking up on this theme of, of, again, again, of orality and kind of bringing oral culture into cinema. Another mm. question, and maybe I could ask this to you first, Zach, about when we try and bring oral culture into a film, I know that film is a, you know, is a, is a different medium certain things are going to change. And indeed, I read, I read this interesting thing, Zach, about you, how you changed the ending of the Atanarjuat legend, and and apparently I I understand that in the the traditional Inuit 
legend, Atanarjuat kills the three men. But but you change you felt it was important to to change that ending. But in order to do so, you went and sought the approval of the elders, and and you were told uh, by the elders that they change things all the time, and that and that oral oral culture is is constantly changing. But but I'm interested in in as a filmmaker, as someone who understands. The, the complex way in which images and editing and sound and music and all of these things and everything that happens within composition. And I'm interested in how you feel oral culture changes when you bring it into a film. What, what parts stay the same and what parts change? I don't know if I have the right answer. Um, I just had a project last summer on this issue on oral teachings, because um, up here in the Canadian Arctic, uh, we have these uh, giant iron ore mines. Uh, they come and they take what they want and they're on our land. Um, since uh, you could see in, in, in my last film, uh, one day, the government agent comes and mm -hmm. starts to uh, gather Inuit off the land to refugee communities. Uh, that's where we are right now in refugee communities from the land. Um, I wanted to know if there's any oral teachings that we could use to fight these mining companies. So I last summer I went, I took elders back to the land in the summertime where they're most, they want to be on the land. That's what they remembered and just talk to them uh, face to face with the camera uh, on oral teachings, hoping that I would find something I could use to fight against the mining companies. But, but oral teaching are all about growing up from your childhood to your elderhood, you respect who's older than you uh, and you can talk down to who's lower than you in your age. Uh, that's what I was learning about oral teachings of womanhood, manhood, elderhood. Uh, it's all about that, it's all about being a good person, listening, respect your elders. Uh, that's all teachings that I found out. Um, nothing to do with European style of working. <laughs> it's only our group. The, it only talks about our group, how we are raised and how we are, how do we die and even I mean, I was amazed to find that when we, in 4,000 years ago, when we buried our dead, was not, we just didn't put them on the ground. They, they, they were fixed, right? So when the time comes, they were, their feet would face the sunrise. When judgment day comes, they come up. Well, that was the I, that is the idea, and even elders and young people are positioned slightly different. Um, that was that's oral history. That's oral teachings. Uh, these things that we don't use today because we're so uh, civilized. Um, we live in democracy, um, so that oral is just. I love it because here's the story I'll tell you. When we're children, when we're growing up, our parents would tell us, you're gonna marry this girl when you grow up. And the girl would know you're gonna marry that boy when you grow up. And they live like that. And one day when the timing is right, they just come together. Uh, as what we call arranged marriage, promised marriage. Um, but 
the story is not always like that. The story is broken too sometimes. Uh, I was just looking for a film idea and I ran into a cross about this girl who was promised to this young man and they're growing up together. The parents are telling, it's gonna be your wife one day, he's gonna be your husband one day. And they knew that in their heads. But the girl's husband, uh, no, the girl's father died and some man came and claimed her and she's, she goes with her mother and to the next camp and all the boys go after her in the next camp. The boy is left behind and the girl gets taken. But this for this boy, she is promised to him. So he goes and get him. So I want to make that film. So that's an oral uh, story that we can watch and because it's all based on two stories. And I could use two story and have it acted out because in our culture, when we learn how to act, we learn how to get into a character. Mm -hmm. um, when people can do that, they're just, just fantastic. Uh, when they play their character, because I'm not Zacharias anymore, I'm now Mick Jagger. Um, and I can move and move my lips like him. So when people can do that, that's what we want. That's, that's, if they can't do that, they can't act. <laughs> so that's, that's what I do. That's what I look for. And also I look for traditional faces. And if it's mixed, I don't want that. I want traditional face. <laughs> I'm very picky. <laughs> Thank you, Zach. Gaston, I don't know if you want to respond to any of that, or if uh, I could, if I could ask you the same question, maybe Gaston, about just how. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously, you're, you you've talked a lot about drawing from oral mm -hmm. culture, drawing from the the knowledge that you got from your cousins, mm -hmm. from from your dad's family. Your your dad mm -hmm. lived in a village, is that right, Gaston? Yeah. And, and yeah. I'm interested in the way in which you, as a filmmaker, you mm. draw upon that oral culture and you bring it into cinema and you, and you kind of use color and editing and you use music and, and, and voiceover. I, I know in, in, in Wen Cooney and, and Bud Yam, the, the use of voiceover to kind of convey stories is very important. Mm. And mm. the moment when Wen Cooney tells his story for the first time to Punieri is very important. Mm. So I'm interested in that process of you as a filmmaker drawing mm. from morality, but subtly mm. changing certain things when you when you make a film out of it. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, to me, uh, you know, storytelling is uh, something very, very uh, unique. Uh, the same story told by two excellent storytellers will be different. And the same storyteller, uh, storyteller, day after day, is never telling exactly the same story because he always had something because it depends of the audience he has in front of him or of her. You know, so they are they are interacting with the audience also. The 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 main uh, the 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 trunk of the story is always the same, but you have some motives that could be added, like you are uh, doing a painting or you are weaving a, a a material. You know that that's the first thing, and the second. It's, it's true, I am drawing from my oral culture, but I can say that uh, this oral culture and the imagination of the people from, from who I, 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 I got life, you know, 
it's it's part of my flesh, of my bones, of my mind, you know. It's something that normally, if you haven't been exposed to a traumatic uh, uh, experience, there is something that lays in you. And sometimes just a single smell of something or a, 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 a song of a bird or a, 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 a light or a landscape will completely exhume all your memory, you know. This is something that I, I, I have experienced a, a, a lot. And, uh, and many people, for instance, just one uh, small story, Tahar Sheria, I'm sure you know that name, he is from Tunisia. And uh, he, has, uh, uh, he is the founder of the Qatar Film Festival in Tunis, you know. And uh, when he saw, uh, when Kuni in 82 in Tunis, where I got the, the, the silver tanit at this festival, he came to me and he said, um, how could you tell the story that way while you have been with the sheep in the bush? And I say, I was not there, but my cousins were there, you know, <laughs> keeping the sheep and they have been able to, uh, to, to transmit it to me. And, uh, and we, we kept, um, unfortunately, some years ago, he, he passed away, but he was always amusing. He, have, he has seen when Puni, I don't know how many times, you know. And this is, it's not only in your own place, but you can also communicate feelings that they already had to other people living in uh, the uh, uh, very, uh, very far from your place. Because what, what counts a lot is not really the, the, the elements, the uh, particular elements of the story. It creates a world, you know, that, that uh, uh, you know, um, uh, that takes the mind and the soul of the of the the spectator somewhere else, you know, and uh, that's that's uh, something because I I I don't think we are uh, theoreticizing about that. We just are, you know, part of something. We. We, we understand something and we, we, we try to, um, to be, uh, to be uh, honest to the feeling we have. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter if the end of the story uh, changes because all the stories are enriched by different storytellers, you know, it's the same elsewhere in the world, you know. And to me, what is very important is uh, to, uh, to keep your, uh, your ears, eyes, and uh, your mind and soul very, very open to absorb what comes from the exterior, but also what comes from your inside world, you know. To, to me, it's, uh, it's the way, uh, since I'm writing the third part of Budia, it's, it's very important for me to keep the, the, the motives, you know, but even the non-spoken, um, uh, not spoken words or meaning that are in Wenkuni and Budiam. And I have to watch back my own films to put myself back uh, as close as I can from the feeling that I had when I was shooting the different scenes. So I am able maybe 
to take what is the, the, the immaterial substance so I can bring it in the third part because I would not like to make uh, like Rambo one, two, three or uh, Little Weapon one, two, three. It's something different, you know. So it's not very easy, but it's the way that you remain faith to your culture, not saying that things doesn't change, but it change according a certain music, a certain tune that you can hear if you are quiet and you are paying attention to the different things. It's my belief. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to be long. <laughs> oh, no. Thank you, Gaston. Very yeah. interesting. Very, very interesting. Maybe I could draw for a, a really interesting theme that I'm hearing coming from, from both of the things that you're saying, Gaston and Zach, is, mm -hmm. is this question of audience. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I guess maybe I could ask this question to Zach first, but it's a question for both of you. When, when you are making a film, who is your first audience? So when, when you are, uh, Zach, when you're directing a film like any of your films, Noah Piergutuk or Knud Rasmussen or Atanarjuat, who do you, when you're behind the camera, who are you imagining as your audience when you're making the film? Uh, my first audience are my people my in my region. I have to ask them because because um, the costumes they make because I try not to mix dialects in my films, so I concentrate in my area in, in the Amito area. Um, so I'm not trying to. Uh, good actors from there and good actors from here. I'm concentrating on my area, my dialect. I'm trying to keep the dialect the same um, because in, in our culture, in the Canadian Arctic, there's a lot of different dialects because mm -hmm. each different dialects have their own different costume. Mm -hmm. So how could you hear that kind of a Dali from this man wearing this kind of costume. I mean, it doesn't look right. So I'm concentrating on my area. And also I, I wanted to say, uh, hearing stories is what we do, what we listen. I went to an elders and youth meeting one time and got my attention, this young man, asking an elder, why is our drum, we call it pillow, the drum, has same name with Kilak, heaven. Why does it, why does it, they do have same names, this young man asks, an elder. Um, and this elder replied, you know, shamans, I mean, we don't hear too much about shamans nowadays because the ban from the church. Sh uh, shamans would raise in their spirit mm -hmm. towards the sun. And I have gone to school. I know the sun is three, 330, is it? 999 million miles away. <laughs> <laughs> I've gone to school, I know, I know how far the sun is. And this old man was saying, you know, they would race to the sun mm -hmm. and the good ones would pass the sun. And when they're coming home and the earth is the symbol of the drum. So I was so flabbergasted when I learned this. Wow, it just blows my mind. How could anybody, any culture think like that? They have to experience it. It's the cloud has a name, Kilak is the heaven, they're coming from the heavens. Well, I was so fascinated to learn that. Um, 
that's what I try to put in my films from the stories I've heard. Uh, that's I don't know what was your question. I didn't just, uh, <laughs> so much, but I, I'm, I'm fascinated by my culture. Well, I, I guess I'm interested, Zach, in just how. So, so it's it's very clear that when you make a film, your your primary audience is an Inuit audience. And yes. I'm interested. I'm interested then as a filmmaker, Zach, in because uh, you know your films are, and it's the same same for Gaston as well. I mean, your your yes. films are very local, very specific, you know, as you say, you, they, they, they feel like they have a real integrity, but, but then they are able yes. to travel all the way around the world. And, yes. you know, you show at an arduo at a yes. can and, and everywhere. And I'm, I'm just wondering as a filmmaker, how you balance those two things. You are speaking first to Inuit, but then beyond the Inuit to the rest of the world. And I'm wondering how you balance those two things as a filmmaker. I'm very lucky because my elders are the same people that came off the land who knows how to stitch these costumes and make these props. Uh, because when I make a film, it has, they're gonna watch it first. And they're gonna know one little mistake I make. They're gonna know the very mistake I make. So my film is put to a test to the highest knowledge of people. And if it pass them, then it can go to the world. That's that's how I work. Have you ever had a film, Zach, which has not passed the elders? Have you ever shown something to the elders and they've said, no, that's not right? Um I would probably fix it. You'd fix it. Okay. I fix it. But if they tell me that's not how we do it, this is not how we do it. This is how we do it. And then yeah. I have to fix it. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Zach. Same question to you, Gaston. How do you balance those two things? Because I know your films are, are so loyal to the, you know, to dialect, to place, to culture. And yet, mm. like Zach's films, they then travel all around the world. They go to, you know, film festivals all around the world. How do you balance those two things in your head as a director? Yeah, because uh, to me, it, uh, it, uh, it appears to be very simple. Uh, one um, one um, guy, uh, one guy said that the day you, you can speak to your people, with their uh, in their language, with the daily words, and you are understood by your own people. That day, you reach equally the level where you can be understood by the rest of the world. It means that, in a way, universality was born into specificity. That's my belief, and I know that if I am able to tell the story, the story based in my uh, homeland, and the people of my homeland understand me, I know that the consequence, the positive consequence will be that the film we speak to rest of humanity. I strongly believe to that because we are all, despite of our differences, we are the same race, the only one, the unique one, human being, you know? And we, we are, uh, we are uh, how you call that, modeled uh, with the same agile, with the same clay, you know? It can take different colors, it can take different textures, but fundamentally, human beings are the same in the world. We cry, we laugh, we love, we eat, we die, and so on. And if the story is really, uh, I would say, um, If it takes 
uh, its uh, its uh, flavor flavor from from the 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 the, the people being in the movie you have a lot of uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, how to say that when i start thinking in french then i miss my words in english but i would i, I want to say that uh, if you are you are you do the right the right thing the right framing uh, you know one thing i i wanted to say you you can see in africa in a country like Burkina, there are around 70 different mother tongues. So if you have 70 people from Burkina, any of them have only learned is or a mother tongue, they will not understand each other. Even my country is not that big, you know, it means that the 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 uh, the people have been able to invent a wide range of languages you know showing the fertility of their mind and spirit and i like that you know and of course what cinema brings to us this outside of the language specifically used it tells without words, a story that people can understand because there is a non-verbal communication. So it's a combination. I uh, like to be in an oral culture, but I know that in my culture, people don't spend time only speaking. They behave, they have attitudes, they, 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 uh, they can tell a lot of things without a single word. So it's, uh, we have to be able to interweave all those things. And this is the, what the storytelling, this traditional storytelling anywhere in the world is rich about and is able to tell stories that are very powerful. Thank you very much, Gaston. Zach, I don't know if you want to respond to that in any way. Does that reflect your experience or is your experience different? I don't know. Probably different uh, and the same. Yeah, probably the same, yeah. Yeah. My audience, uh, what I'm scared of, <laughs> if it passed them, that's what I noticed when I made Arunabhya, because that was our first try. Mm -hmm. And it had to pass, the story had to pass. And then when I showed it first time in my community, to the people who told the story, to the people who acted the story, um, I was so scared, <laughs> but when I started hearing people laugh, people clapping, I'm doing my job. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, that's that's the approval I look for. Uh, I always done it like that. I tried to show it first to my community and then out to the world. Um, I don't know that answer your question. Yeah, thank you, Zach. Thank you. Um, one last question for you both, because I'm aware that we have a whole, I don't want to ask all the questions and then leave nothing for us to talk about <laughs> next time. Uh, so, but I just wanted to ask you both about this, this idea of a, a people's cinema. So mm -hmm. our, our film festival is called the folk, the folk film gathering. And I guess, mm -hmm we we set it up because we were interested in the idea of a a people cinema and what i mean by a people cinema is is a cinema not just made for the people but of the people and by the people i mm -hmm. i think that when i look at film culture today particularly in the west 
there is so much um, film culture that is so individualistic. I think that there are so many Western films just about the individual. Mm -hmm. And what really excites me, uh, wherever I see it, wherever wh whether I see it in the cinema of, of Burkina and Gaston, Gaston's work or in the Inuit cinema that I see in Zach's work is this sense of a cinema that is close to the people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just wanted to ask you, uh, maybe I could ask Zach first, is that something that resonates for you? Is that something that you think about? Yes. Yes, it does. And it shows in my films, and nobody probably don't understand them, um, because uh, in our culture, we live by namesakes. Uh, I'm, I, I have my grandmother's name. I was born when she died, so I carry her name. So we live by namesakes, and in in one day you'll see a scene where the white uh, white man is coming by dog team, and they start talking about grandmother. That's my grandmother, but you don't see grandmother. That you see my grandmother running. Uh, there, it's the namesake because they're, he's carrying their grandmother's name. So that's what I try to show in my films. A lot of uh, probably non Inuit don't understand it, but I, I put that in and probably distract audience a little. So that's what I try to put in my films is our culture, our namesake, and how we deal with it. Because we live it every day in, in, in our culture. Because when my older brother died, I had a son named after him. So I call him brother, even though he's my son, my youngest son. I still call him older brother. And I wonder if Gavison, is that culture runs like that over there? Gaston, does that happen in Burkina? Is there is there a, a tradition of naming? Um, so like, like Zach is describing, when when one yeah. member of the family dies, another a newborn is is named after that. Does that happen in Burkina? Yeah, I, I believe so because it's the reason why sometimes you have people uh, because when, for instance, your grandfather uh, passed away and you come, they will give you his name, but they can call you by the name of the grandfather. So they say, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the little one. And of course, if you are not from the family, you cannot understand what Bila means. Bila means uh, the, 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 the youngest. The, the, the little boy, but the name has been, uh, his name is the same with his grandfather. And by respect for the grandfather, they can call him right by the name of the grandfather. Before it was, it didn't have consequences because we didn't have a birth, uh, birth documents, you know? So people of the family know he is called Bila because he wears the same name with the grandfather. But now you have people, you can, they, they are called Bila and it is written in their uh, document. But if you don't go in the family, you will not have the explanation about that name. So it's, uh, it's uh, uh, the, same, uh, the same with uh, Zacharias, uh, but it is, uh, it is com composed uh, di differently, yeah. So I, I, to me, I think it is, uh, it is uh, obvious that we first do, we first make our films to communicate, to transmit something to our community, you know. And, uh, and because that community is a kind of, uh, nuclear representation of the whole humanity, of course, it will also 
be able to speak to other people in the rest of the world. And to me, I, I, I believe uh, sometimes I see films, even when I have seen Atanajouat, uh, I said uh, it's a good thing that uh, Zacharias made that movie because I couldn't be able to make such a nice and uh, deep and profound story, you know. It's, uh, it's the way that a movie brings you another world and you get into and you say, that's a movie, you know. It reminds me the day that I was in 84 in Japan, uh, invited by, uh, with nine other filmmakers uh, from Africa by the Japan Foundation. And they, 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 uh, they say to us, if there is anything you would like to do personally, do not hesitate to inform us. We shall do our best to satisfy you. Then I said, I want to see The Naked Island. You know, that movie made uh, in the 50s by, uh, uh, by Kaneto Shindo. I heard a lot about that movie. When I was a student in Paris, I couldn't get the chance to see it. So in 84, I got a theater for me alone. They projected me that movie. After the screening, I stayed there for more than one hour and a half. And the projectionist came to me. He said, it's okay. I said, it's okay. But I was in somehow stuck on my seat because what I've seen has moved me in a way that I said, that's all. No, 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 you are not a filmmaker. You cannot do a so powerful movie. So stop it and go uh, to drive a truck or whatever. Because when I was young, I was dreaming to, to drive a truck, you know? So I said, maybe I, I shall be better in that. But after one and a half, when the projectionist came again to tell me, would you like to watch it? Twice, I say, no, it's okay. And then at the end, I say to myself, but Gaston, don't be desperate. Just trust that you can learn more, you know. And then I was released and I was able to stand up and uh, go outside the theater. You know, cinema is something that that's, it's not just a question of uh, watching and, uh, and uh, uh, loving the story. It, it, could, uh, it could tell you something that goes in a deepest way, so it, uh, it even uh, recreates you in a way. I am not a film critic, so I tell just what I, what I feel, but uh, I was happy to, 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 uh, yeah, to continue trying to, to tell stories that, uh, that are uh, so simple that they are very strong. Thank you, Gaston. Zach, yeah. did you want to say something there? Yes, I also noticed when um, when I use namesakes, when actors are playing their namesakes, they they do their research, they do their research, and they start acting like their namesakes. Like you know, in one day in the life of Noah Pivot, took there's a lot of people playing there with they're using their namesakes. So mm -hmm. they're playing their their, 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 their name. So they feel proud and they want to do it right and they want to they want to show it. So it's a lot. I would like that when I'm filming. I find actors playing their namesakes really coming strong. Thank you, Zach. And I guess, I guess one of the things that kind of really strikes me, just as a kind of concluding thought, 
listening to you both is the way that actually cinema continues culture like i think i think that if i think about both of your work and i think of gaston what you're saying about the the village culture and the knowledge and as you described being at school and and learning this stuff which seemed far from from your life from the lived experience of your life of the sky and the names of the trees and and mm -hmm. and zach your films that are that are giving you know ongoing life to to the oral stories to to the stories of the elders it strikes mm -hmm. me that in both of your work there is this sense that cinema can be a, a sense of continuity it can it can you know where in the past we zach you talked about oral culture and keeping everything in in one's head it it mm -hmm. seems that perhaps cinema now is a way of keeping things moving forward is is that something that you both that resonates for you in your films uh, for, me, for, me, uh -huh. okay. Okay. for me um coming from the culture where we don't have paper and pen we just found that the camera is the perfect tool <laughs> you don't need paper and pen you just talk mm -hmm. I mean, when I interview elders, they they want to tell the truth because they're on camera. They want they don't want to lie. So it's a tool. It's a perfect tool. And when you know how to edit now nowadays, um, you can even make it better. It's, I, I know. I always say this. I know down the road it just going to get better uh, right now. We do it a little bit rough. I guess we're just creating it now, but down the road, uh, it will get better. That's what I suspect. Thank you very much. I mean, I think from, from my perspective, your work is very, very good now. I don't think it needs to get much better, but and, and Gaston, maybe I could, I could just ask you the same question. Cinema as a means of continuity cultural continuity is that something that resonates for you yes of course i think that uh, i think our films uh, are no more belonging to to us to zacharius or to me it belongs to our community you know they are the the because we have told something that um, that uh, uh, tells their their lives, so it, it it's something that is part of the the collective patrimony, you know. And uh, I am very grateful uh, to people when they see my films and they, uh, as Zaka you said previously, they applaud, they are happy. It's like you you gave them a gift, you know while you are the one who is gifted you know to be to be have been able to make a a work in which they recognize themselves this is the the hugest uh, the hugest gift that could be uh, uh, given to a filmmaker you know to me so i hope maybe i am a dreamer but i'm not the only one Zach, maybe we 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 just I I I I I often say to my students, do not pretend to be uh, bigger uh, than uh, your your work. Your work will be always bigger than you, always, because it will uh, travel by itself. Uh, you you make a movie that movie becomes a kind of being able to meet people to create relationship with the, the spectators and then uh, yes of course uh, I believe that uh, uh, our films are contributing to a kind of uh, continuity of uh, uh, culture building. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much. I think that's a good place to 
to leave things for today that we've we've been talking for 90 minutes so thank you both very much for your your patience and for your stamina <laughs> so, so, it brings us together yes yeah, yeah. I, I think so thank I, you nice I to meet you oh go on zach yeah i have russian friend and i know there's eskimos in russia but i had never seen them yeah but i met this russian filmmaker alex Sell, um who i met in um the film uh tef uh, oh uh, i had and his films are about uh what i make like what they do in russia the inuit over there they hunt like us they ride their boats like us and, but they they're russian but i've never seen them i will never see them in my life but cinema brings it to me and i see it it's beautiful mm. thank you sir. yeah i think cinema i think that you've put it very very yes. nicely cinema brings us together yeah. cinema brings yeah. us together yeah. Thank you both so much. This has just been such a wonderful session to 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 hear from you both and and to to kind of share some thoughts. Uh, I'm very grateful. Thank you very much indeed. Thank um, you. And we will. So we will have folks at another session live with yes. an audience okay. uh, in two weeks' time. And that session won't be hosted by me. It'll be hosted by. Uh, my colleague and Gaston's friend Rod Stoneman. Um, yeah. But it seems from just from talking today, it seems like there is there is so much more to talk about. So uh, I very much look forward to 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 seeing you both in conversation again. So thank you so much for your generosity you. and your patience. It's been wonderful yeah. to see you both, and we'll look forward to speaking again soon. Yeah, I shall have the pleasure to listen to Zachary. You sing it. <laughs> Say hi to your family, Zach, and yes, tell them we have a new friend somewhere in Africa. <laughs> I've been to your country. I yes. in Adelaide. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. See you later. Bye bye.